Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jan Kristalaw, and I'm here today on behalf of the Canadian Network for International Surgery. And I want to talk to you a little bit about indications for cesarean section. Here's the main principle that I really want you to take away from this lecture today. Any surgery, but especially major surgery, can be associated with major complications. And cesarean section is a major surgery. Therefore, it is important to be confident that cesarean section is always performed for a clear indica indication and that it's never done unless it's absolutely necessary. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what the actual indications are. Let's first of all look at maternal indications. We've seen some of these over the last few days, and I'm sure you can think of many that aren't on this list as well. Um, things like gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and eclampsia, which can lead to uh, an emergent situation requiring immediate delivery, which has to be by cesarean section because of the severity of the situation. You may decide to carry out a cesarean section because of a previous cesarean section uh, or previous uh, uterine surgery. In other words, a scarred uterus. And you may decide uh, to uh, carry out a cesarean section because of other anatomic obstructions. So for example, a, a, a myoma in the lower uterine segment or a vaginal septum uh, or another anomaly, for example, uh, in the case of a bicornuate uterus or even uh, things like large vulval vaginal condylomata, which may block the descent of the baby. All of these are reasonable causes and they have to put it, be put in their clinical context. Sometimes, of course, we carry out cesarean section not for maternal reasons, but for fetal reasons. Evidence of fetal compromise or lack of fetal well-being is a very common reason for this. Uh, cord prolapse is another one, uh, less common and certainly dramatic when it occurs. Mouth presentation, uh, including things like uh, some breaches, absolutely. And congenital malformations may lead to cesarean sections, for example, the hydrocephalic baby. Uh, in some uh, clinical settings, untreated HIV or untreated herpes simplex uh, can be uh, reasons for this, as well as other uh, infections. And of course, some twins, depending on the uh, presentation, of especially of the first twin. And then there are the, the indications that actually uh, span the uh, maternal fetal interface. These would include things like the abnormal placenta. This would include everything from the placenta previa, the vasa previa, and placenta accreta, and abruptio placenta, often, uh, of course, associated with the preeclampsia eclampsia. The most common um, uh, indication, certainly in Canada, uh, is uh, of cephalopelvic um, disproportion. And usually this actually um, leads to a long labor. Uh, and sometimes uh, it becomes clear that uh, it's going to be a long, difficult labor. Uh, and that failure to progress uh, is equated with cephalopelvic disproportion and leads to cesarean section. This can be a very large group. Uh, and this is the group, I think, where we really need to be careful because it's easy to, uh, to bail and do a cesarean section, um, but it may not always be necessary. Just wanted to say a few words as well about fetal distress. Uh, it may be diagnosed either by auscultation or by electronic fetal monitoring. Often in Canadian hospitals, it is uh, it's diagnosed because the, the mom is on an electronic fetal monitoring system. Um, and, but we know that it is not a very sensitive tool. And many cesarean sections are done uh, because of, of for fetal distress and may not be necessary. We know that many, many very, very healthy babies are born after, uh, after the diagnosis of, of possible fetal distress is, is made. But uh, that is always a retrospective diagnosis. And if you're truly worried about the baby, um, going ahead with cesarean section may be your only choice. In terms of breaches, talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, but some breaches are candidates for vaginal delivery. And of course, as we talked about yesterday, 
uh, we always want you to feel confident that you, you can deliver a breach, uh, do a vaginal breach delivery safely. But there are some that are not candidates, and these include footling breaches, the large baby, uh, this, and actually this sometimes the smaller baby, especially if um, there is a, um, an expected or a predicted uh, uh, fetal anomaly of some sort. And previous cesarean section uh, may be another uh, relative contraindication. In any case, whenever you're dealing with a breach, uh, have a very low threshold for intervention and you have to be ready to do a cesarean section should you need to do so. Previous cesarean section. This is a big category and certainly again in our hospitals, it becomes one of the main indications for, for subsequent cesarean sections. So in other words, you've had a cesarean section for an emergency or uh, fetal distress or failure to progress the first time, and then the second time, instead of having a, a, an attempted vaginal birth after cesarean section, you have to have, um, you opt to have uh, a booked cesarean section. And certainly this is a massive category in our hospital that actually puts our cesarean section rate up quite a bit. Um, Remember though that vaginal birth after cesarean section can be safe and it can be a very good option for women, especially if they are planning more than one subsequent baby. This is a big thing to consider. If the first one, especially in a very young woman, has been a cesarean section, but she can deliver the second one naturally, then subsequent pregnancies after that will be more straightforward and the risk of needing to do a cesarean section subsequently for her third or fourth baby is actually lower. Something to keep in mind. Obviously, we always worry about the risk of uterine rupture from previous cesarean section. But the risk is relatively low. Um, we have all, uh, I think, uh, witnessed the situation where we have uh, a uterine rupture or a uh, a uterus that has thinned out to the point where rupture is imminent. Uh, so we do actually always need to keep this in mind. Um, also remember that the risk is much, much higher if there is a previous classical cesarean section incision in the uterus. So always do the lower segment transverse when you're doing the cesarean section if possible. When you're considering the route of delivery, after a previous cesarean section uh, and you're considering a vaginal birth after cesarean, uh, selection of candidates is really a, a critical thing. And you can se select your candidates appropriately by considering the re reason for the previous cesarean section and being aware of any contraindications that uh, are um, especially uh, uh, pertinent to this particular patient. And also knowing her plans for the uh, future pregnancies. And this is a big thing to consider. Every patient you see, every woman you see, is in front of you in the present pregnancy. But please think of her, her whole reproductive career when you make these decisions, because you are actually um, really limiting her choices for the future, especially if you do that second cesarean. Of course, there are contraindications to vaginal birth after cesarean section, and I've alluded to a few, a few of them already. If she's had two or more previous lower segment of cesarean sections, um, it's a relative contraindication. Most people would say it's an absolute contraindication. If she's had a previous classical cesarean section, even if it's just one, then that's a contraindication. Multiple, multiple gestation, um, in other words, if the present pregnancy is a twin pregnancy uh, following previous cesarean section, we generally think of that as a contraindication because of the uterus being overstretched and overtaxed in terms of the um, of its ability to uh, to stretch further and therefore putting uh, more uh, tension on the uterine scar. Certainly, if you know she has a contracted pelvis, if you know that she has a very narrow inlet and that's what caused the problem the first time. Uh, proceeding with VBAC makes no sense because you'll fail again. And if there's a previous complicated cesarean section, for example, extensions, wound breakdown, anything like that, that's going to weaken the healing of the uterine incision, anything like that can be a contraindication to VBAC. 
and of course any absolute contraindication to vaginal delivery um, for whatever reason, so whether it's maternal or fetal. I just want to finish off by thinking again about final considerations. Obviously, there are many, many things that happen, and every time you're in the labor room, something will happen that you haven't seen on a list of indications, or every clinical situation is going to be a little bit different. But whatever the indication, whyever you're deciding to do it, please assure yourself that the surgery is absolutely necessary because you are putting a scar in that uterus and that scar is going to be there for the rest of the woman's life. The perception of C-section as a safe or easier alternative to vaginal birth is in fact not grounded in fact. And that's certainly true, especially with women who are planning multiple pregnancies. And I really want you to remember the point that I've made a couple of times, and that is please always think about the whole life of the woman in front of you, the whole reproductive life of the woman that you serve. Having a scar on her uterus will affect her future reproductive possibilities for years to come. And uh, you really owe it to her to do whatever you do uh, for a very, very secure reason that you can always justify. Thanks very much for your attention this morning. Uh, as we go through the morning, we'll be hearing more about the actual uh, procedure of cesarean section uh, and um, talking about many other aspects of it as well. Thank you.